Okay, Michael, can you tell us? Yeah, this we're... is uh, our boardroom, the old uh, honey pro producing building. Uh, and it's where we keep our finished lumber, kiln dried, planed, ready to sell. And our customers come in here and they just go through it, pick out what they're looking for. Uh, we have about 24 to 26 species in here at any one time. What you're looking at right here is our black cherry. It's uh, an elegant, rather sought after wood for cabinet making and furniture. And earlier I was telling you a little bit about book matching pieces and whatnot. This would be an example here. Uh, we do it out of almost any lumber. It gives you some more decorative ideas for making panels and you know, two sides of a piece that would match. That's a really interestingly figured uh, hard maple. It's called blister figure. And it's sort of uh, sought after. It's like quilting and bird's eye and all those other interesting things that maple does. Uh, we do book match almost all the species here so that people have an option. But otherwise, uh, everything in here has been kiln dried and surfaced. It's smooth, uh, and it all comes in random widths and lengths because we're frequently, as I said, changing the logs and you know sawing different sides, cutting off uh, bark and knots and things like that. And let's see, down here, there's a couple of interesting things down here. Um, behind these slabs, a little bit of uh, honey locust here, which I haven't seen before. I just saw that. And then behind that is some very beautiful, uh, thick, two-inch butternut. And butternut, remember, is that tree that I told you that we're losing to the butternut canker. And we've gotten some nice butternut logs lately in from... I tell some loggers and neighbors that if they ever come across them um, to let me know. It's really a fairly beautifully figured wood in general. Another wood that we have quite a bit of, and I guess it's really down below, though we can see some matched pairs of it here, is American chestnut. And that was the first one to be uh, just about wiped out by a blight. And there were a few trees north of Savannah that I heard about, and a man brought over some logs, and we we have that, which is rather rare. Um, do you want to move further back? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. As an example here, this is a set of book matched uh, slabs with natural edges. This is black walnut. These pieces match beautifully. They're kiln dried, surfaced. Uh, you can see the natural edges here, which people usually just finish like that. Uh, this set would make a fine dining room table or something like that. Behind them there's another set of red elm pieces, also full two inch, also natural edged. Really unique tabletop materials. Some long cherry here, uh, white oak, silver maple, and quarter sawn white oak which is right here. And Bob, you asked about quarter sawn white oak. Right. And I can show you clearly the quarter sawn flake, as they call it, are these patterns that go horizontally across the wood. And what they are is the rays of the wood cut longitudinally. Now, how close can you focus? Can you get focused on that? Yes. Okay. Do you see how the rings here go absolutely perpendicular to the side of the board? Yeah. All right. That would be quarter sawn lumber. And what happens is, if you can see the rays that come out from the center of the log, you notice that where they're perfectly perpendicular to the cut here or parallel to the cut, that's what you're seeing make all of these marks, is those rays being sliced. And because the rings are perpendicular to the board, this board will never cup, which is why these are frequently used for the tops of tables. 
Now what it does do, because of the difference between tangential shrinkage and radial shrinkage, is it will move this way a little more. And you always notice that as you run your hand across the top of a table that's quarter sawn. You know, sometimes one board will be proud of the next, and that's because there's lots more movement this way than there is that way. There's a big difference between tangential, radial, and longitudinal shrinkage in lumber, and understanding it really helps in being able to dry it properly and get it into good usable condition. Also, how and where you use it. Quarter sawn lumber is also specified in much boat building for the same reason, because they don't want it cupping. Frank Lloyd Wright loved it. He used it almost exclusively inside a lot of his houses. Uh, to the extent, I think, when you look at that pattern everywhere, that it's just a little busy. <laughs> but that's a, uh, an aesthetic determination by me. Okay, down here we've got another little bit of interesting lumber. You kind of move down there. Okay. Okay, this is an example of some of the lesser known woods that uh, make beautiful furniture grade lumber. Your slippery elm, which people call red elm, uh, is probably the most stable of all the elms for making furniture out of. And really quite beautifully figured, nicely surfaced. This is the uh, rare one back here. This is American chestnut, which we are, are going to see again in maybe 60 or 80 years when these new chestnuts become large enough. But we have this both in clear lumber and people really seem to love the wormy stuff where the worms have gotten into it um, as the tree died, leaving either holes or, or tracks. Another one back here that's a little on the unusual side is hackberry. It's a nice lumber planted up and down the roads of Illinois as shade trees and, and roadside trees. It's a nice yard tree. Arborvitae, what people call white cedar. Normally we don't deal with any conifers, but if they're going to cut all the trees down in a cemetery and someone brings them to me, I'm happy to saw them. Uh, another one, I'm going to reach behind you here and get it, that a lot of people consider to be junk wood is box elder, which is really an ash leaf maple. It's a beautiful wood. It's very easy to work and frequently has this red streaking in it or red blush. And very often is quilted and sort of translucent. And over here is some more of that blister maple, blister figured maple. The maples where we live don't grow very naturally in the timber because it's pretty much out of their range. So most of our maples come from town trees that die or have to get taken out. This one was removed because they were putting a new sewer in in Mount Carroll. And it just happened to have this beautiful figure in it. And back there you see the aromatic cedar, which people make the chests out of and whatnot. Why don't we trade places so we can take a look at the cedar? Okay. 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 And this is the aromatic cedar, the eastern red cedar that uh, smells so nice. These grow naturally all over the fields around here if a field is let go. They'll come in and grow until somebody gets rid of them. These are uh, especially prized for making blanket chests and things to store wool products in. The cedar naturally keeps the moths out. Some more of the white cedar or arborvitae here. Silver maple, very nice secondary wood. Box elder, shagbark hickory. Very hard wood that's become quite popular lately for making furniture and cabinets. Uh, a wood that we have a lot of in our timbers around here. As I said earlier, it's very shade tolerant and it's quite common in the timbers of northern Illinois. Super. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, are we running? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is my current sawmill. It's uh, a little larger machine than I had before. It's almost all hydraulic. We load the logs onto the machine with uh, one of these loaders that you see out here, depending on the size of the log or the big one further back. And these are vehicles that we use in getting logs out of the timber also and moving, moving lumber around in the yard. The log is loaded there. The fences are hydraulically operated. There's a clamp system that's hydraulically operated. There's a log turner that's hydraulically operated. The log stays here, and the band here, saw, goes through the log. And this thing is just going back and forth. It's raised and lowered hydraulically. And then every time it comes back, it brings back whatever it has just cut. These fingers go over the log, and then they bring back the slab or the, or the board or whatever. And I operate this completely from the opposite end. Um, as the wood comes off, back in there, we start stacking it onto rolling carts on stick, with stickers in between. And back in here, you can see some of it. It's stacked just like that. It's then, when it's full, rolled out there for air drying into that lean-to. Or out here, we stack it uh, behind you here, some of it outside some of them in the far buildings and shelters over there. And the wood is air dried for about probably a minimum of three months, sometimes as much as six months to a year, depending on the species, depending on the thickness, and depending on how badly we need to have it run through the kiln. Um, after it's air dried, it's put into the kiln, which is back there, that wooden room which we can take a look at. Okay. Can you hear me? I think I'll turn the fans off so that it's a little easier to hear. Uh, this is a dehumidification kiln. It holds about 4,000 board feet of lumber. And as you can see, the lumber is very carefully stacked in there, uh, wall to wall, and all the way to the top. And at the very top, there are three fans that blow air continuously through the stack. There's no exchange of air, per se, from the outside. The building comes up to temperature because of the heat of the motors. There are five motors in there, four fans, and one motor that runs the compressor of the dehumidifier. And the building is insulated to huge factors. And the temperature comes up to about 90 degrees. We turn on the dehumidifier and the dehumidifier takes the moisture out of the container. We run the dehumidifier at the rate that is best for the hardest to dry species that's in there. So if we have white oak or hickory in there, we take the moisture out at about 1% a day. If we have an easy to dry species, we can take the moisture out faster than that. I check the moisture both in the kiln at the edge of the boards and we have probes that we put in the center of the kiln which are attached to wires that come out here and can be read individually with a moisture meter. We're shooting for between 6 and 8 percent moisture. This kiln load is done right now and I'm just running the fans to condition the lumber as the kiln cools down. It's a very precise way of drying lumber uh, and it's especially good because you're not blasting hot, dry air onto green lumber. You're allowing the building to come up to temperature and then gently taking the moisture out. Uh, it, it gives us uh, probably a little more high quality and we save a lot more lumber that way. Okay, we're rolling. Okay. Um, most people sell their kiln-dried lumber rough. We plane everything that we produce here. We find that the customer can get a much better look at the figure and the quality of the wood. There'll be no splits or cracks or knots hidden. Um, and we plane it quite well, and then we trim the lumber with the various other saws, table saw, cut-off saw back there. 
so that there's really no, almost no waste whatsoever when somebody buys a board from us. We find that that's easier in our market because a lot of people are amateurs. Uh, they might be doing some woodworking for the first time. They might be working with some of these harder to deal with species for the first time. And the fact that we trim it all off and get a good surface on it, uh, I think helps sell it quite a bit. And no one goes home with a rough board, planes it, and finds a bunch of surface checking or something like that that they didn't know. It's a little bit more work, but it's uh, a little more added value, too. And then from here, it all goes into the boardroom. Okay. I mentioned my love of old trucks, and I have restored and licensed uh, a number of old power wagons like this. And this one stayed because it's our main logging vehicle. Uh, we've got 300 feet of cable on it. It can go just about anywhere and does a lot less damage in the timber than a large skitter would. Um, it's a little bit slower, but we don't really need to do high production here. I bought this from a man down uh, in Morrison, and he had bought it from a gas station that went out of business in DeKalb, Illinois. We decided to keep their slogan on the side of it when we did some repainting, even though now it's a, it's a lumber vehicle. It's a 1949, which is auspicious because I was born in 1949. <laughs> And it's going strong. And if you, are we off? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this isn't the beginning, but it is an example of the method that I told you we're using now to try to foil the deer. Everything off to the right here was planted four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, the trees were all planted in tubes and everything was let to grow around them. So you can go in here and you can find the trees that we planted, the big sycamore there, the cherry here, but then you also find the bitternut hickories and the hackberries and the poke and all of the other things growing up with it. And as long as I keep track of it and make sure that the species that we planted are getting enough light and growing straight, it's just exactly what we want because the deer have a hard time selecting just my specific crop trees out of this uh, apparent chaos. And if it grows dense enough, it's hard for them to even get through it. Uh, over here, we have a little bit older plantation, and I think we'll move the camera and continue this. Okay. Okay, we're rolling. Okay, this is an example of a little bit older mixed species plantation. We have ash and red oak and white oak, some American chestnuts, uh, and various other species in here, some Kentucky coffee tree. Here, the trees have been selected out. We've done some um, clearing around them. You have your oaks, ash. These nice tall straight ones are the um, American chestnuts. We've had a tree come down in a storm here and damage some of these. The technique for those is we'll cut them off at the ground. It's called coppicing and they'll grow six to eight feet the first year. Um, at this point we're managing this timber a little bit differently, this plantation a little differently. We are cutting some of the brush out and we're cutting a lot of the competing trees away. Now stage five would be back here. Here's a plantation that's 20 years old and you can see that this one is well on the way to making a natural forest. This is a plantation of ash, walnut, sugar maple, and some oaks. And here you can see something that really starts to look like a timber again. And up in the tree here is the emerald ash borer pheromone trap, which hasn't been checked yet.
And Michael, what are the, some of the species we're looking at again? Uh, on the outside uh, are ash. The trap is hanging in a white ash. And then inside are walnuts. Um, there are some sugar maples and some red oak in there also. The ash, the ash make excellent trainer trees for the walnut. Frequently we'll plant walnuts very densely because we want them to self prune and reach for the light to grow straight. And the ash grows slightly faster and they make good trainers for the walnuts. Uh, a lot of times they're removed afterwards. We also use sycamores as training trees and um, eventually you know you start out and you might plant four to five hundred trees per acre and when you're done they're going to be 75 to 90 trees an acre. So you have to thin them. Okay, this is an example of maybe stage one plantation. Uh, this area was cleared last fall and we planted it this spring. And you can see how fast everything grows up. But as an example, here are the tubes that we use. Usually use two footers. And this is one of those Schumard's oaks, the more southern varieties that we started to plant. Back here is a nice example of a tulip poplar coming out of a tube and as you can see once these guys get going they really like to grow. Another Schumard here already the competition from a bitternut hickory is pretty strong. I don't know what we've got in there, another Schumard, I guess. Here's an interesting one here. Another species that wasn't native here when I came. This is a Kentucky coffee tree. It's a compound leaf, quite a beautiful tree. And we really won't do any thinning in here, probably for another year or two. And then that will just be to knock down the competing uh, species, maybe if something like this gets too tall over the oaks. <laughs>